Today on the Perception in Action News, a look at a couple recent motor learning studies. How can we build on basic concepts like contextual interference and extrinsic feedback to speed skill acquisition? So it's time for a call to action. Hi everyone, this is Rob Gray from ASU and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception and Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In these news segments, my goal is to dig through that ever-growing pile of article PDFs so you don't have to. So on to the news. Dateline, International Journal of Kinesiology and Sports Science, April 2016. Back in episode 9, I talked about the concept of contextual interference. For those that don't remember, this is the basic finding that blocked practice, where the performer repeats the same skill over and over, leads to faster acquisition of a skill as compared to random practice, where the performer switches randomly from one skill to another. Random practice has a benefit that it leads to better retention and transfer in the long run. The theory behind these effects is that random practice produces a high degree of contextual interference. That is, the actions required from one skill like putting in golf interfere with the actions required of another, like chipping. While this can make it hard to learn the skills in the short term, it results in a more robust motor program in the long run. In that episode, I also pointed out that the effects of random versus blocked practice are much stronger in the lab than what you typically see on the sports field. Well, a recent study by Passand and colleagues from Shiraz University in Iran attempted to build on this previous work in a couple ways. First, they performed another test of the contextual interference hypothesis using a real sporting task, in this case, volleyball. Second, and more importantly, they looked at whether it's possible to get the best of both worlds in training. That is, if we gradually transition an athlete from block practice to random practice, will we be able to get both fast learning and better retention and transfer? To investigate this question, 45 novices were split into three groups of 15. Each was taught a forearm pass, a set, and serving skills in volleyball over three weeks of training with three sessions per week. The first group, the blocked group, performed 15 passes, then 15 sets, then 15 serves every session. The second group, the random group, performed these skills in a completely random order every session. The final group called the gradual increase group started with 40 out of the 45 attempts blocked. That is 14 serves followed by 13 sets followed by 13 passes. Then they did five attempts of randomly ordered skills. The next session they came in, they did 35 out of the 45 training attempts in block fashion and 10 in random. After this, the number of random attempts was increased by 10% each session until by the last session they were doing the exact same thing as the random group. Each group was evaluated at pre and post testing and there was a retention test. There was also a pretty weak transfer test in which they were asked to perform the same skills just from the other side of the court. Scoring was based on the accuracy of the shots. For example, four points was awarded when the ball went into the target area. What was found? Well, first I should say that I had a very difficult time understanding the results of this study. Mean scores were given in one table, with some, but not all of the scores given as a fraction. So for example, the pretest score for the random group was 13 out of 42, while the retention score was 35 out of 78. I have no idea what the denominators are supposed to be in this table. Furthermore, it's a bit frustrating that they collapse the scores for the different skills. Finally, the numbers seem a bit fishy. For example, the random group had a score of 18 during the acquisition phase, then this jumped to 34 in the retention phase. I have a hard time believing their performance almost doubled after practice ended. That's a heck of a lot of consolidation going on. But anyways, the main findings were as follows. Consistent with most previous research, the blocked group scored better in the acquisition phase than the other two groups. Also similar to other findings, both the gradual increase and random groups did better in the retention and transfer tests, 
with there being no difference between these two groups themselves. Overall, I think the idea of gradually changing practice sessions is an interesting one that deserves more study. In talking with coaches, it seems like many are doing this already, whether it's transitioning from explicit to more implicit learning or opening up the constraints in practice. This study was unfortunately a bit weak to detect the benefits of this type of graduated training. Along with the scoring issues I mentioned, three weeks is a pretty short duration for a training study with novices. So hopefully this idea can be explored a bit more rigorously in the future. Dateline, Frontiers in Neuroscience, May 2016. Back in episode 18, I talked about performance feedback and how too much can be a bad thing. In particular, I'm not sure I called it this at the time, but I talked about the so-called guidance hypothesis. This is the idea that too much extrinsic feedback is a bad thing because the learner begins to rely on it at the expense of becoming attuned to their own intrinsic feedback. Thus, during competition, when extrinsic feedback is taken away, performers that were given too much in practice suffer. It's also been proposed that too much extrinsic feedback can lead to maladaptive, short-term overcorrection of movement, even when it's unnecessary because performance is good. The bulk of research that has examined the issue of frequency of feedback has examined what is called terminal feedback. That is feedback given at the end of the action. So, for example, a coach telling a baseball batter their bat velocity after the swing is completed. In episode 18, I also discussed how with new technologies, we are now much more able to give athletes concurrent feedback about the performance. That is, information given while they're in the middle of executing their action. I talked about this with the Ghost tennis serving device in episode 18, and also with Kathy Craig in my interview in episode 22D. So given these new developments, an important question to ask is, does the guidance hypothesis apply to concurrent performance feedback? Is too much still a bad thing? This question was addressed nicely in a recent study by Fuji et al. from Toronto. In the study, 20 participants were asked to learn a new coordination pattern when reaching for a target in front of them. In technical terms, they were asked to flex their elbow and abduct their shoulder at the beginning of the movement. In the middle portion of the reach, they were required to extend their elbow while keeping their shoulder abducted. Finally, at the last portion of the reach, they were asked to flex their shoulder to hit the end target. Or, more simply, as the authors put it, they essentially were required to learn a hook punch movement from boxing. While forcing someone to use a strange pattern of movement to reach for an object, instead of letting them do it naturally, may sound kind of silly, it actually has an important applied purpose. In rehabilitation, for example after stroke, patients will often use compensatory strategies, for example bending their trunk instead of reaching with their arm to pick up objects. They often have to be forced to use their injured limb so its function can be recovered. But back to the Fuji et al. study. To help participants learn this new pattern of movement, a sonification technique was used. As I discussed in my interview with Kathy Craig, this involves creating a sound that is somehow linked to our movement. So for example, I can make a tone get louder the faster you move your hand, or the pitch of a sound changed based on the pattern of a rower's movements. In the Fuji et al. study, the feedback sound varied in intensity in proportion to the current error in the joint coordination pattern, a calculation that was based on the desired joint angles. So, for example, if your elbow was bent at the wrong time, you would hear a loud sound. Vision was occluded during reaching movements. 20 participants were split into two groups. 10 that received the sonification feedback on 100% of the trials, and 10 that received it on only 50% of the trials. 
Immediate and delayed retention tests with no feedback were also given. What was found? Analysis of the movement errors, both constant and variable, showed no difference during the acquisition phase. Both groups got better at the same rate. Interestingly, there was a reversal of the traditional effect for both the retention tests. That is, the 100% group showed smaller errors than the 50% group. The authors proposed that this was a function of the task complexity. That is, more feedback is better when tasks are harder, and less feedback is better when they're easier. Consistent with this, most research supporting the guidance hypothesis has been done on very simple tasks. Another very interesting finding was that the 100% group showed a higher variability in their movement patterns during acquisition as compared to the 50% group. While in traditional theories of motor learning, expressed in ideas like the guidance hypothesis, high variability is treated as a bad thing. Fuji and colleagues suggest it may have been indicative of exploration of the movement space in their study, which of course can be a good thing in terms of skill acquisition. In the near future, I will be devoting a full episode to discussing the pros and cons of high variability in movement, and we'll return to this issue. Well, that's it for the news. Coming soon on the Perception and Action podcast, the effects of music on sport and exercise performance. Remember, you can find everything you ever wanted to know about this podcast at perceptionaction.com. Also, if you're interested in articles like the ones I reviewed today, Follow me on Twitter at ShakyWeights as I post links to many more like this. This is your intrepid reporter Rob Gray from ASU. I am out of here.